with their Roman prisoners in ropes, the Sasanians returned to the Persian heartland. The king's victories were his credentials to govern. The tradition of kingly principles was passed down and later recorded in a document known as the Testament of Ardashir. The superiority of the king over his subjects resides solely in his capacity to perform praiseworthy deeds and noble actions. Persian confidence came from the top, from the authority of the king of kings. Every man in his army knew that the king's power was absolute and seemingly invincible. Rome never overcame it. Within their strictly defined order, the Persians felt themselves and their land to be the chosen stretch of the earth. Our country, though small in comparison with other countries, enjoys more advantages and a more abundant life. All that exists in other parts of the world is brought to our country and is for our enjoyment, be it food or drugs or perfumes. And the King of Kings has cast the shadow of his majesty over all who have sent him tributes. Despite the growth of their empire, the early Sasanian kings remained faithful to their roots. Here in Fars, Shapur built a new city on the proceeds of his raids into the Middle East and with the help of his Roman prisoners. It became a great commercial center. Because this is thought to be a temple to Anahita, isn't it? Um, yes, this is so, David. Um, the, re the reason is that here you see the water, the temple arranged to receive water, to receive water pouring in from all corners. Behind the social order was the spiritual order of the native religion Zoroastrianism. Its god was Ahura Mazda, who held the balance between good and evil, between fertility and drought. Pockets of Zoroastrianism survive in Iran, although Zoroastrians are more conspicuous in India as the Parsis. Shirin lives in the village of Hassanabad in southern Iran. At the dawn of each day, she and her neighbors collect water from the village stream before washing pollutes it. For the Zoroastrians, purity is sacred. Shirin circles her house with fire, a ritual cleansing. And the various elements that Zoroastrians particularly respected, fire and water and earth and so on, would you say they were the main ingredients of the religion? Well, look, David, this is what you've got to think about. Here's a world which was, was made by Ahura Mazda, the god, made to be as good as possible, made in a harsh conditions with constant enmity, nature and of the demons. This care of Ahura Mazda for the world was made plain to men in the fire, above all here in the water, and one can see how much one needs it, in the earth that is made fertile by the water. And what other responsibilities in terms of living did a follower of Zoroastrianism have? Well, he had to keep things going. It was very much a religion of keeping things going, of keeping the water, pure and clean, of keeping the land under cultivation. 
But then, of course, you can't just have land and water because there are human beings in it. So you've got to keep oneself in well organized, in an upright society. Herein's is the family house, where she and her relations keep their stores. Early each morning, Shirin prepares the day's bread. What was the position of women in general at this time in society and society? I mean, were they held in higher or lower esteem than the general norm at that time? They were held in high esteem because in, in Zor Zoroastrianism they were, as it were, helpers of the men in carrying out the good deeds of Ahura Mazda. They looked after the things which the men lived from. And so Sasanian history is the history of very important women, important noble women, important queens. The baking of bread is followed by the burning of incense and by a prayer of thanksgiving, spoken in the Zoroastrian language of Sasanian times. Shirin prays to the 33 angels each one responsible for a day of the month, each representing a human quality. They who strive to understand and reach true life should preach the law of Mazda to mankind better by acts of service than by words. Priests officiate at a monthly feast in the fire temple of Yazd, an ancient city. It is uncertain when Zoroaster appeared on the plateau, perhaps a thousand years before the Sasanians. His theology replaced the old pagan rites and influenced Judaism, Christianity and Islam. He gave his followers the choice between Ahura Mazda, the wise and thinking lord, or Ahriman, the devil. It's very much from very early times, the Zoroastrians were known as the upright men, the men who did not lie. The, the sort of anti-life principle was always called the principle of the lie while the good principle was always called the principle of the uprightness. The produce of the land is important in Zoroastrian ceremonies, from wheat, representing fertility and planted in time to ripen for this ceremony, to juniper, myrrh, eucalyptus, and the evergreens which always grow from the courtyards of temples. Before he dies, a Zoroastrian may will money to hold regular feasts, 
so that the community should remember him. This distribution of food is not merely symbolic. Better off people can give food to the temple for the poorer ones. In the inner sanctum of the temple is the sacred fire kept burning permanently, a flame that often marked the partnership of God and the Sasanian kings. This really is a majestic rock relief here, Peter. And both figures look almost godlike. Well, David, I think that's part of the whole point of the rock carving. The front leg of each horse, perfectly carved, so well carved, you can see the artery running down it. And what is the king, what is Shapur exactly being presented with? Well, he is reaching out his hand to receive the ring of kingship the ring of empire over the world, over the bit of the world which he controls. And he, he has gained it by his conquest. In the second year of Perose's reign, the air dried up and water in the channels became as scarce as musk. So it was in the third year and the fourth and because of the drought, no man was left with sufficient food. The mouth of the atmosphere became as dry as the dust. And in the channels, water was rare until, because of the multitude of dying men and cattle, there was not room to set foot on the surface of the earth. An even worse punishment was the decimation of the Sasanian king, Perus himself, and his nobles by the Huns. Within half a century, Persia recovered. The Silk Route from China reopened and camel trains linked the plateau with Eastern Asia. The nation was more than ever at the hub of international trade. Peter, the, uh, this is, Firuzabad was one of the largest uh, Sasanian cities, but there's something curiously symbolic about the way it's designed, isn't there? Oh, yes, David. This town, with its round circular wall, at every point of the compass, a gate leads out. So it is a perfect symbol of the, the city and the empire as lying at the crossroads of Asia. It sums up perfectly the way the Sasanians thought of themselves. They f were very well aware that they lived it, in the center of Asia. They knew of China far to the east, of Central Asia to the north, of India to the south, and away in the west they knew of the Roman Empire. Obviously, if you're living at a crossroads, commerce is very important, but what sort of trade in particular was the most important? Well, they were at the end of the trade routes, and they had to make sure that they controlled the raw materials that didn't go anywhere else. So there were problems almost of industrial espionage, how to make sure that the, the silkworm didn't come outside Iranian territories. So, in the middle of the 6th century, Byzantine merchants took the silkworm all the way from Afghanistan, hidden in their bamboo walking sticks, so as to introduce the, gr uh, the growing of silk into the Roman Empire and hence into Western Europe. They would be shipped out of the Persian, Persian Gulf, 
ports, and they'd go to the kings of southern India. But the Persian merchants were careful never to send any horse doctors. So in this strange climate, the horses would all die off predictably, and you'd get a really rapid turn. And with all this trading going on in and out of the country and so on, obviously a very, a very great interchange of ideas was taking place, a sort of cosmopolitanism. Oh yes, most certainly, David. This was part of the whole Sasanian way of doing things. Good example, in the 6th century, you have at the court of Khusro Anoshevan, a Persian doctor, Burzue, who travel all the way to India, translating Hindu books. Um, his commander-in-chief would be a Christian, an Armenian from the mountains of the north, and Husro's great successor, Husro II. His favorite wife was the beautiful Shirin, who was also a, a Christian lady from the provinces of the extreme south. On a tide of great wealth, the Sasanian kings had turned their backs on the plateau and moved to Lusha, Mesopotamia, building this great palace at Tessiphon. With it came a change in the order of Persian society. In their alliance with the king, the Zoroastrian priests had grown powerful. But now they were demoted by King Khosro I, who replaced them with bureaucrats, reformed the taxes, and earned the title of Khosro Anushirvan, Khosro the Just. Khosro's coins bear the legend, he delivered the world from fear, marking Persia's destruction of the Huns. Military resurgence continued under Khosro II, who within 16 years had pushed west into Egypt, into the walls of Byzantium, seeking to restore the ancient Persian Empire. But these cautionary words of Ardashir's were forgotten. When the sovereign isolates himself from people, the shadows of ignorance envelop him. Heedless, Khosro II went hunting. Four centuries later, memory was still vivid enough to pass into the epic Book of Kings by Firdosi. One day, the Shah conceived a longing for the chase and made all ready in the fashion of ancient kings. There were brought along 300 horses with golden trappings. On foot, there were 1,000 loyal slaves with javelins in their hands. Also, there were 700 hounds collared in gold which seized gazelle at the gallop. Accompanying all were 2,000 minstrels ready to play airs. Before all went 500 camels especially picked for their beauty. The whole road was sprinkled with water, which you might have thought was rose water, mixed with amber, to ensure that if a breeze suddenly sprang up, it might not settle dust on that felicitously born king. While the king indulged his pleasures, his western expeditions collapsed within six years under a brilliant counterattack from Byzantium, and the excesses of the court alienated the people of the Persian heartland. Well, Peter, the uh, Sasanian palace behind us fell into gradual disuse, but the end of the Sasanian era itself was, was anything but gradual, wasn't it? Were there specific reasons for their vulnerability to such a sudden collapse? Well, David, you know, in the ancient world, all empires are as, as fragile as foam on top of the ocean. Everything that counted in favor of the Sasanians in their days of success, their size, their long horizons, these counted against them. 
as soon as the capital was lost, as soon as the rallying point of the King of Kings was on the move in flight. But there were also other sort of specific factors of alienation and so on abroad in the society, weren't there? Yes, there was the strain of war and the strain of the classes falling apart. The court isolated with its policies looking towards the West, towards the final conquest of the Roman Empire, alienated from the great landowners on the plateau. And on the plateau itself, the great landowners no longer able to keep the loyalty of their supporters. What they felt was that they had no protectors left. Nobody came to make sure that, that the irrigation dikes worked. Nobody gave them the protection of sure arms. And so they would have shrugged their shoulders. The Sasanian Empire came to that very sudden and very dramatic conclusion, as we shall see in more detail next week. But a number of the qualities we've seen that make up the Sasanian style and so on were to survive, weren't they? Oh, yes. Well, I think in two ways. First of all, there is this sense of a style of rule, and a style of rule controlled by the general values of the society. This meant that throughout the Near East, even until today, if you want the idea of a just king, you think of Husro Anoshevan. And then on the more humble level, but the one that will really survive, these are the values summed up in the Zoroastrian faith. The values that lead to the preservation of the good things of life, the good things which the gods gave to the land of Iran, water, greed, organization. And it is the dogged determination that these things, that what they would have called the good things of Ahura Mazda, should continue in a land where they can never be taken for granted. Where is Husro Anushirvan, the best of kings? Where is Shapur gone before him? Death has not respected him. His power is shattered. The crowds no longer press at his gate. Where are these kings? which the winds of the east and the winds of the west have swept away like dry leaves. The wave that now swept over the plateau was of a different people, the people of the desert, nomads, tent dwellers, and people consumed by the zeal of a new faith. It was more than an invasion, it was the coming of a new and permanent theology. Sometimes, when the end is near, it takes time to realize it. Some of the Sasanians retreated to this redoubt on the top of a mountain. They seemed to think that if they stayed up here long enough, the Arabs would simply go away.